It's great to see you at Connection Point and be here with you on this Father's Day weekend. You know what they say about fathers. We're guys who carry pictures where our money used to be. <laughs> Actually, uh, maybe you've heard the story about the semi-truck driver who pulled his semi into a truck stop. And he got out of his truck and he went in to get something to eat. And he ordered some food, and just as the server brought his food, a gang of very tough-looking motorcycle riders walked in. And one of the bikers pushed the truck driver out of his seat and sat down and just started eating his food. Looked like there was going to be a fight. But the truck driver just got up, put down a $20 bill to pay for his meal, and walked out. The biker sneered, and he said, That guy isn't much of a man, is he? And the server stared out the window and she said, nope, not much of a truck driver either. He just backed over 10 motorcycles out in the parking lot. (laughs) Just seemed like the right time to tell that story on Father's Day. But it does raise the question, what makes somebody a real man? Jesus Christ defines manhood for us. Jesus had a courageous spirit, a tender heart, and a core of faithful character. And whether you're a man or a woman, Jesus is the one from whom you can derive your true identity. Now, Pastor John, as Brooke just pointed out, has been encouraging us to read the book of Proverbs this summer, whether it's just a a few verses, a verse or two here and there, or a chapter at a time. It's a great book. And I want to start this message from Proverbs chapter 3 with some fatherly wisdom, some fatherly guidance. And that's a lot of what the book of Proverbs is about. It's about a father speaking words of wisdom to his children. Listen to this from Proverbs 3, beginning with verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies and nothing you can desire can compare with her. Blessed are those who find wisdom, it says. Do you realize there is a prayer that you can say? And you're almost guaranteed that God is going to say yes? I'm talking about the prayer for wisdom. If you ask God for wisdom, he wants to say yes to that prayer. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, I need that promise because I often lack wisdom. I need to ask God for wisdom every day. How about you? Our culture is flooded with information, but we're starving for godly common sense. And that's the way I define wisdom. It's common sense that comes from seeing life as from God's perspective. And wisdom, that kind of wisdom, the wisdom that God gives, is more precious than gold or silver or anything else you can, you can possess. When Solomon was a young man, he asked God for that. In fact, God told him, Solomon, ask me for anything you want. This is an incredible thing when God says, you can pray for anything and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, I think feeling young and overwhelmed as he became king of the nation of Israel, Solomon said, give me please a discerning heart. And so God said yes to that prayer and Solomon ended up speaking, according to 1 Kings 4.32, Solomon ended up speaking 3,000 proverbs, short nuggets of godly common sense. Now, you know, years from now, when I'm gone, if people remember one witty thing that I used to say, I would think that's pretty cool. One. But Solomon spoke 3,000 of them, and many of those nuggets of godly common sense are recorded for us in the book we call the book of Proverbs. Now, I want to show you just a few to kind of introduce this that just ring true to life. For example, Proverbs 14, 13 says, even in laughter, the heart may ache. Isn't that true? Haven't you noticed sometimes you're at a party and everybody's laughing or they're telling jokes and maybe you're laughing along on the outside, but inside you're feeling sad, your heart is hurting. Or how about this one? Proverbs 17, 22, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Do you ever hear of endorphins? 
Your body actually produces chemical substances that make you feel better and make you feel more cheerful. If you're happy on the inside, it actually makes your body feel better. Here's one that I like, Proverbs 20, 14. It's no good, it's no good, says the buyer. Then off he goes and boasts about his purchase. Ever go to a garage sale? <laughs> you know, you say, no, 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 it's no good. I, I, I. And then you buy it and then you go and say, man, you wouldn't believe the good deal I just got on this item. It's true to life. This is the way Proverbs are. Do you ever find it hard to handle money? Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Do you ever eat too much? Ever drink too much? Proverbs says, do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. It's actually interesting. If you continue and read that passage in Proverbs chapter 23... It describes in detail what it feels like to get drunk. It describes bloodshot eyes, hallucinations, nausea, needless bruises, stressful relationships, confusion, and numbness. And then, when you continue reading that scripture, it concludes with the person who has drunk so much that they're miserable saying, when will I wake up so I can find another drink? Which underscores the addictiveness of it because even though it's made you miserable, you want more of it. I mean, this book is true to real life. It makes us spiritually streetwise. It speaks to us about real situations that we, that we face. Here's another one, Proverbs 26, 17. Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel, not his own. That makes me chuckle. I think of my little dog. You know, she's a very gentle dog, but if you grab her randomly by the ears, she's probably not going to like you very much. And this is saying, you know, don't meddle in disagreements where you're just going to get hurt or hurt somebody else. And here's my favorite one. It always makes me laugh. Proverbs 27, 14. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. At least let your neighbor get their morning coffee in, okay? You know, even if you have something really nice to say about your neighbor, don't say it loudly and don't do it at 5.30 in the morning. Now, these are just examples of the way the book of Proverbs speaks. It's just true to our lives. But one of the challenges, when John asked me to speak to you today about the book of Proverbs, the Proverbs are kind of scattered. They're random pieces of godly wisdom scattered. So how are you going to, in one message, just kind of summarize what this book is about? Well, here's what I decided to do. I'm calling my message today, Guard Duty. Guard duty. If you've been in the military, you know what I'm talking about. Moms and dads, though, you also are on guard duty for the sake of your children, protecting them, watching out for them. And this applies to all of us. For example, the book of Proverbs tells us to guard our words. Guard what we say. Do you ever say something that you immediately say, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. That got me in trouble or it just came out wrong? A minister I know meant to ask his congregation to pray for the people in the rest homes, but instead he said, pray for the people in the rest rooms. Came out a little funnier than he had thought. Another friend of mine who's a preacher preached a whole sermon about Samson, but he kept calling him Tarzan. <laughs> now, if you know the biblical story about Samson, you can kind of see why he would make that association. <laughs> I misspelled a word in the church bulletin one time. Instead of a message from God's word, it said a massage from God's word. <laughs> the most difficult muscle in your body to discipline and get in shape is your tongue. I mean, when you go to the doctor's office, one of the first things they do is have you open your mouth and they have you stick out your tongue because they can tell a lot about your overall well-being by telling what goes on from your mouth. And so it is with our words. What, what you say says a lot about what's inside of you. The average person says about 25,000 words a day. Some of us with gusts up to like 50,000 or more. And our words can help people or they can cause a lot of harm. Can you think of a time when you wish you had kept your mouth shut? Proverbs 10, 19 says, He who holds his tongue is wise. Did you ever say something hurtful? Proverbs 12, 18 says, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Did you ever come on too strong with what you said? Proverbs 15, 1, A gentle answer turns away wrath, 
but a harsh word stirs up anger. Did you ever confide in someone too freely and they abused your trust? Proverbs 20, 19, a gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. And another verse says, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. So don't add fuel to the fire. You're on guard duty. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you write in an email or post on social media. And I have a piece of advice for you about how to do this. You need an editor. We all need an editor. You know, I've done a fair amount of writing in the course of my career, and I've learned to appreciate editors because they help me avoid mistakes. I can finish a piece and I think, oh, I've said everything I need to say, and the editor, a good editor, will find mistakes in it, things that need to be corrected or said differently so there's no misunderstanding or confusion. We all need editors. And here's my advice. Let the Holy Spirit be your editor. So before you have that complicated conversation, before you press send on that email, ask the Lord to evaluate your words and sift out what needs to be edited. Guard your words. Second, guard your ways. Guard your ways. Now, the word way appears frequently in the book of Proverbs. It's easy to overlook it, but if you're careful and notice it, it's a very instructive word. It means the path that you're on, the road you're traveling on, the direction you're going. And sometimes we use the word way in sort of a disparaging or negative way. We will say, well, that's just the way our marriage is. In other words, these are the habits, the behavior patterns, the direction that we've fallen into. Or you hear people say about fathers, oh, that's just the way dad is. Or that's just the way kids are today. Well, what is the way that we are choosing to take? Notice what it says in Proverbs 5.21. For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and He examines all of your path. Your ways. God is watching the ways that you're on. And notice Proverbs 16.17 says, Those who guard their ways preserve their lives. Guard your ways. You remember the old Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way? You know, I can tell you, I've done it my way a lot, and it's gotten me into big trouble. <laughs> my way is not always a very good way. It's always inferior to God's way. In fact, Proverbs twice, in Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25, twice it says the exact same thing. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. There's a way that's very foolish. My way is never as good as God's way. So the Lord told Isaiah, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. So Proverbs warns us about some ways of life to avoid. Let's look at them. It tells us not to take the way of laziness. In fact, one of the themes of Proverbs that you run into is industriousness, hard work, diligence, responsibility, not the way of laziness. I remember when my kids were little, we had a hamster, and they named it Theodore Roosevelt Faust III. I don't know why. And I just thought, Teddy Roosevelt, all he does is just eat and sleep. He lies around all day in his cage. Now at night, he would get out and he would go around in a little wheel inside his circle. I thought, what a life. He eats, he sleeps, and he goes around in circles. But then sometimes that's what I do. <laughs> you know, when, when I die, I don't want my tombstone to say, Dave Faust, he ate, he slept, he went around in circles. This is a description of what the book of Proverbs humorously calls the sluggard. It uses that word, sluggard, to describe somebody who's just kind of lazy and, and slack in what they do. Now, I don't, it reminds me of a slug. I don't want to be a slug. I don't want you to be a slug. Nobody, but that's the word that's used in Proverbs. Like in Proverbs chapter 26, I want to read three verses, and each one paints a picture of what a lazy person is like. It says, a sluggard, or lazy person, says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. Now, why is, because he's saying that because that's his excuse for not going to work in the morning. Oh, there's a, there might be a lion out there, you know. I might get eaten by a lion. Oh, yeah, right. It's just an exaggeration. The next verse says, as a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. Oh, he's so lazy, he just can't get up in the morning. Or the next verse says, a sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but he's too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. He's so bored and sluggish, he can barely even eat. I can tell you, I've never been that lazy. I've been lazy, but I've never been too lazy to bring the food to my mouth. 
So don't take the way of laziness. Instead, Proverbs tells us to be diligent and hardworking, responsible. Proverbs also warns us not to take the way of unfaithfulness. The way of unfaithfulness. Proverbs 3.3 says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Now, on Father's Day, it's a great time to think about that word, faithful. What a wonderful one-word description of a person who's, who's doing, uh, who's, whose life is going the right direction on the way of faithfulness. To describe someone as a faithful spouse, a faithful parent, a faithful worker, a faithful friend. Now, the book of Proverbs applies this in a specific way in relation to sexual faithfulness. And it paints a picture of sexual temptation. And you can read it in chapters 5, 6, and 7. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about being faithful. Let me ask you, on Father's Day, a lot of people are going to grill out. You know, you take some hot coals. and Would, would you, at the end of the meal, take that bunch of hot coals out of the grill and just dump them in your lap? I think not. Well, look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs 6 says, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. And when it talks about this damage that results from adultery, from sexual unfaithfulness, it's not only talking about the actual physical act, because in the New Testament, in light of Jesus' words, it also is talking about our state of mind, the attitude that we have and the, the way we look at things and look at people. I'm a baseball fan and this year in spring training, I was interested when the general manager of the Kansas City Royal, Royals baseball team announced that he was requiring his players to participate in training sessions about resisting pornography. Actually, he took a lot of criticism for taking that stand. But he said, and I increased my respect for him, he said, repeated exposure to pornography degrades women, harms families, and it even reduces the amount of mental focus that you have to hit a baseball. And so as the boss of the team, I'm going to say, I want you not to be addicted. I want to help you not be addicted to pornography. What an interesting thing. That in so many ways, the state of mind of an unfaithful path, an unfaithful way in your life can damage yourself and damage others around you. And decrease even your performance on the job. The Bible says in Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, instead, rejoice in the wife of your youth. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Don't take the way of unfaithfulness. And don't take the way of foolishness. Proverbs has a lot to say about the contrast between foolish ways and the ways of wisdom. But don't misunderstand here. Foolishness in the Proverbs way of thinking. It's not just about how intellectually smart you are. You can be a very smart person. You can be very successful at your work and still be very foolish, according to the book of Proverbs. Look, look at what it says. A fool is hot-headed. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Fools give full vent to their rage. You know, preparing this message for Father's Day weekend, you know, the prayer that came across my heart. Lord, please never let my kids substitute my own, my own name in any verses like that. I don't want my kids to say, well, dad is hot-headed. Dad finds no pleasure in understanding but delights in airing his own opinions. Dad always gives full vent to his rage. I don't want my kids to think of me that way. In Proverbs, the fool is someone who is morally immature, someone who is spiritually and morally never really growing up, content to remain a child or an adolescent inwardly, no matter how smart he is, how physically strong he is, how capable he is on the job. A foolish person is someone who remains spiritually and morally immature and is happy to just stay that way. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Guys, if we're going to lead the next generation, men need to step up and grow up and act like mature men. We cannot lead our children well if our own lives are on the wrong path, going in the wrong direction. And notice, it's about the path, the way, the direction. All of us make mistakes. 
None of us are perfect guys. But will our kids and our grandchildren see that we're on a path to seek to honor the Lord, a path to keep growing in Christ? My own father, my dad, was not a perfect man. He was a good guy, but he was not a perfect man. He was faithful in his marriage to my mom for almost 64 years before he died. And he expected a lot of me and my brothers. But one thing I remember about his priorities, my brothers and I loved baseball, and so we went out in the yard and we made a baseball field in the yard, complete with bare spots for bases and bare spots in the grass for base lines. And I remember somebody asked my dad, doesn't it really bother you that the boys are tearing up your yard like that? And my dad shook his head and he said, no, I'll have time to raise grass after I've raised my boys. And when he said that, it said so much to me about the fact that he loved me more than he loved having a perfect lawn. There's a verse in Proverbs 22, 6, kind of a famous verse. It says, start children off in the way, there's that word again, in the way they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Notice that. Start them off in the way they should go. The importance of getting kids started right. One time I paid a guy, he was a very good craftsman and construction worker, carpenter. I paid him to put new tiles in the shower in my bathroom at my house. And I knew he was good at what he did, but man, after a while, I was kind of looking at my watch saying, when are you going to get going? Because he spent a long time at the beginning of the day measuring, drawing lines, cutting. And finally, it hit me. What I realized what he was doing was he was being very careful how he got the first line of tiles set. And once he got the first line of tiles set and they were level and straight, then the rest of them went up fast. He knew what he was doing, but he got that first line set right. And I want to encourage and exhort you guys who are young fathers with young children. Ask God to help you get that first row right. To do a good job with them while they're young. Now, ironically, I became a father when I was 24, and I knew very little about it. And I was so inexperienced, I had to rely on the Lord to help me. But I'll tell you, you will be so blessed if you get the, the, the line drawn right early on and at first because they grow up so fast. And I'll tell you, parenting is hard. Kids are messy. There were always crumbs in the jelly jar every morning when I had my young kids at home. But I remember one time when my kids were little, and I had a busy day at work, and then I had to go back and work again that evening. I was teaching a three-hour class that night. So I rushed home ate some supper, and then I went out to get in my car and rushed back to work. And when I got in my car, my driveway was all cluttered, as usual, with bikes and basketballs and other kinds of kids' stuff. And I was in a hurry, so it was annoying, and I had to walk the bikes off the driveway and kick the basketball over to the side and get everything cleared out. And then I hurriedly got my car in gear and pulled out and started driving down my street in a big rush to get back to work so I wouldn't be late. And I looked in the mirror, my rearview mirror, and I saw my youngest daughter kind of playfully running down the sidewalk toward me, kind of waving goodbye and running toward the car. I saw this in the rearview mirror, and all of a sudden I felt like crying. So I realized, and I just said, God, what am I doing? I'm in such a big hurry to get back to my work that I'm forgetting about the most precious gifts you've given me. I stopped my car, just kind of sat there for a moment, talked to the Lord, and then I got out of my car and I walked over to my daughter who was suddenly by now looking very startled and uncomfortable. <laughs> and I went up and I scooped her up and I gave her a great big hug. To this day, she probably didn't know, know what that was all about. <laughs> but as I got in my car and I drove off, I said, Lord, help me not to take for granted these moments or to think that anything that's going on at work is more important than my time with these little ones you've given me. You know, now that I'm older, I spend a good bit of time looking in the rear view mirror of my life and kind of replaying a lot of moments with my kids. And my driveway is remarkably uncluttered these days. But sometimes I kind of miss the basketballs and the bikes in the way. I treasure those moments with my kids when they were young. 
And I'll tell you guys, at the end of your life, you won't wish you spent more time at the office or on the golf course. But you might wish you spent more time with your children. What good is an A at the office if you're getting an F at home? The scripture says when they are old, they will not turn from it. Start them off in the way they should go. Now let me just point out, many times in the book of Proverbs, there are general statements that are not meant as an absolute ironclad. This is the way it always turns out in every circumstance. Start them off right. It's an encouragement to do that. Even when they're old, notice that. Sometimes kids kind of get wayward for a while, but give them time. Pray for them. Eventually, some, they will come back. But this is not an ironclad thing. And, and, and let me tell you, this is also not a reason for parents to just be overwhelmed with guilt because your adult children are responsible for the decisions they themselves make about their walk with God, about the way they live their life. You've got to bring them up the best you can, and then you have to let them, let them go. Give them roots, and then give them wings. There is a wonderful verse in Psalm 127. It says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Wait a minute. How are kids like arrows? Well, arrows have to be aimed, and so do our kids. If they're not well aimed, arrows can hurt people, and so can kids. But the main thing is, in order for an arrow to do what it's supposed to do, you have to let it go. You can't hold on to the arrow. You pull it back and then you let it fly. And that's what we do with our kids. But as somebody pointed out, you can always pray for a favorable wind. And that's what we parents do. We pray for a favorable wind to direct our kids on their way. Don't take the way of foolishness. And don't give in to the way of despair. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs. It's one of my favorite verses I want to share with you. This may be exactly the message that God has for you today because sometimes we feel like a boxer who's just feeling like I've had it. I'm beaten up. I'm going to throw in the towel. If you've been feeling that way, if you ever feel that way, don't throw in the towel. Instead, look at Proverbs 23, 18. It says, there is surely a future hope for you. And your hope will not be cut off. If you are somehow sinking into despair today, I want to tell you, don't give in to it. There is still a future hope for you. Your hope will not be cut off. For those of us who believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that verse has special meaning to us. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Take the towel and wipe the sweat off your face and get back in the fight because there is surely a future hope for you. In fact, those very feelings of despair and deep discouragement and darkness can be the very thing that drive us to realize how much we need God. Frederick Beekner tells the sad but true story of a 15-year-old boy who murdered his own father. In anger, he rose up and killed his dad. And when they arrested him, they asked him why. And the boy said over and over, because I hate my father. I hate him. I hate my father. So they put him in jail, and in the darkness of night, a guard was walking through the prison, and from the darkness of this young man's cell, he heard the boy sobbing, and through his sobs, the boy kept saying over and over again, I want my father. I want my father. And Frederick Beekner, who tells that true story, said, it's not only a story of one family's brokenness in a way, it's a parable of our whole culture because on the one hand, people are saying, we don't need God. We don't want God. God is dead. We don't care what God says. We don't want him in our life. We hate God. But then in the depths of our soul, on those dark nights when we're alone, something deep inside of us says, what I need more than anything else is my Father in heaven. And I'm here to tell you on this Father's Day that your Father is there. Regardless of what your relationship has been with your earthly father, how disappointing that may have been or how happy that may have been, you have a father in heaven who knows that you need him and who loves you more than my words can express. Fact is, I don't live up to God's perfect standards and you don't either and I'm not always wise and I'm not always discerning. And my heart isn't always pure and sometimes I'm foolish and my words can get me into trouble. But that is why as much as I love the book of Proverbs, it is such a great book. I need more than just the book of Proverbs. I need more than just advice. 
that I sometimes live up to and sometimes do not. The book of Proverbs is great, but it's not enough. I'm glad it's in the Bible, but I'm glad it's not the only book that's in the Bible. Because we need more than good advice. We need forgiveness when we fail and strength when we are weak and grace when we mess up. And we need a friend when we are alone. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I believe that that verse ultimately is pointing toward Jesus Christ who sticks closer to us than even our family members could. Jesus is that friend. Jesus is that personal source of all wisdom. He's the one who never says a foolish word, who will never leave you down the, lead you down the wrong path. And the Bible says in Proverbs 20, 24, 16, though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. You may fall again and again, but with Jesus' help, you can rise up again. You can rise again because he rose again. You can get back up because Jesus is there to help you up. You're on guard duty, but you're not on guard duty alone. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He's the way for you to follow in your life. So guard your words, guard your ways, and most of all, guard your heart. Guard your heart. In fact, this is so important that Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do, flows from it. It's the wellspring of the rest of your life. I'm glad I don't have to be on guard duty by myself, that the Lord is right there with me. You don't have to be a parent by yourself. You don't have to go through life alone. God is on guard duty with you. In fact, it says in Philippians 4, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And one of my favorite verses of the whole book of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. I love that where it says, lean not on your own understanding. Think about that. It's physically impossible to lean on yourself. <laughs> you just can't. If I stood up here right in front of you right now and I said, you know, I think I'll lean on myself right now. You can't do it. I would just fall down on the stage. You can't lean on yourself. You have to have something or someone, remember the song, we all need somebody to lean on. We do. We can't lean on ourselves. We can't just lean on our own understanding. We have to have somebody to lean on. And so I want to tell you that these verses are very personal to me. These aren't just things I'm saying because I'm the speaker today. Throughout my life, even in recent days and recent weeks, I have had to learn, once again, to lean not on my own understanding, but rely on God and trust in Him with all my heart. Years ago, I led a Bible study for young adults in a college community, and a young medical student who was studying to be a doctor started attending the Bible study that my wife and I were leading. His name was Charles. Charles and I became close friends, and I had the privilege of baptizing him into Christ. And in the process of our getting acquainted, he met my daughter Michelle, and he liked her. And a couple years later, I had the privilege of performing their wedding. Charles is my son-in-law. He's an adventurous guy. He loves to hike and play volleyball. I love him dearly. And he became a really good doctor. After years working in the ER, he is great at diagnosing illnesses. Last month, out of the blue, Charles found a tumor in his own hip. He looked at his own MRI, and his heart sank. And so did the doctor who was looking at it with him. As a doctor, he immediately suspected cancer and a not good kind, if there is a good kind. But for the last few weeks, we've been walking through this together as a family. In years past, when I got bad news, I would call my mom and dad, even when they were old, and I would find comfort in talking with them. But now both of them have gone on to glory, and now my kids call me, and they ask me, Dad, what should we do? And after wrestling with this and going through all this, you know what I've told them, what we're going to do? Here's what we will do. We will trust God. That's what we will do. We won't lean on our own understanding. We will lean on the Lord. And after many tests and... Uh, weeks of 
uh, anxiety. We're not out of the woods yet, but I'm happy to tell you that this life-threatening situation seems to have faded just a bit. We're now having word from a top doctor at the Mayo Clinic who thinks that the tumor, in his words, quote, favors benign. And so on Thursday this week, my son-in-law is going to have surgery to remove the tumor, and we'll know for sure what we're dealing with. Maybe God is uh, going to spare us what we've been fearing. We'd appreciate your prayers. But here's what I want to tell you, because I've watched my own heart go through this, and my wife, and my kids, and my grandchildren. Trusting God is a smart way to live. It's a wise way to live your life. God does not just sit in heaven shouting down advice at us. And as great as the book of Proverbs is, I'm so thankful that God has revealed these practical truths to us. He is not just a drill sergeant barking out orders from a distance. He is our Father. He's with us in our pain and fear and grief and anxiety and uncertainty. His son, Jesus Christ, laid down his life for us at the cross. That is the measure of the Father's love for us. Jesus rose victoriously and walked out of the grave alive again three days later. That is a measure of the Father's power. And so when the sun is shining and when the clouds roll in, we will trust God. And when the news is good or when the news is bad or when the way is clear and when it's confusing and foggy and when money is abundant and when things are tight and when you are young or when you are old and when we live and when we die, we will trust God because who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.